Bill Doyle and. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Now. So this is Bill Doyle and Sophie Kirsten on Vermont issues. And we're proud to introduce Ryan Christensen, president of the Caledonia Spirits. Welcome, and uh, we're, we're so pleased that you're here. Well, and thanks for having me. And, uh, it's, it's a great thing for a, a town of 10,000 to have a have a Caledonia Spirits. How many such uh, businesses are there in, in the country? It must be every state has. For, for the uh, distillery? Yeah. Um, th there's several, you know, we're, we're a part of what we call kind of the craft distillers. Craft is kind of a funny word because nobody really knows exactly what it means, but smaller distilleries focused on producing better quality, you know, smaller batch kind of products. But the state of Vermont has, I think it's about 24 distilleries now, <laughs> really? which is which is quite a few. When we got started, there were three. Uh, wow. That, that was in uh, 2011. Talk about your decision to, to come to Montpelier. Well, so we, uh, we've been growing our business pretty steadily in Hardwick um, since 2011. It's been on a very steep incline. And uh, Three years ago, really four years ago, we started to really feel the pressure. We, we could tell we were running out of space, and we needed uh, a bigger space, and, um, and we wanted to be able to make more products, too. So we, we started searching out, you know, where could we expand to in Hardwick, and we really couldn't find um, a site in Hardwick that mm -hmm. met our needs. You know, we needed land, we needed uh, a city sewer system, um, we needed space. Ideally, we wanted it to be uh, not disconnected, but all under one roof. You know, so our marketing folks and our distillers are all working under the same, same roof. I like to joke that I spend half of my time, and I don't even know if it's a joke anymore, traveling in between facilities. Ah. Um, so well, so how, many acres, how many acres do you have? Well, we, we, ha we currently have a 6,500 square foot space in Hardwick, and then we have a downtown office building that we rent. Um, and then additionally, we have offsite warehousing in Morrisville. Oh my gosh, see so here. Um, and then we have offsite inventory in, in various states that we distribute to. So once we move into Montpelier, uh, we're going to have about 26,000 square feet. We'll have our distillery, we'll have our barrel house, we'll have our offices, um, a retail room, a cocktail lounge. It'll all be under one roof. And that's going to you know, put the team back into one space, which will you know, really work well. Talk about some of the, the amount of the taxes that you will be paying. Uh, Montpelier is is um, an expensive town, um, but it's also a town with a lot of opportunity. So we we, we weighed that. Um, Montpelier uh, actually is one of the only towns I found to tax personal equipment. Um, so that was a, a tough pill to swallow. We we found out that the equipment that we bought in Hardwick and paid for um, is now going to be charged a personal property tax. Um, which we evaluated that, and um, and and we're we're at peace with that. We 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 that could be better. How much are we talking about? Um, I I don't have those figures in I front mean, of me. Roughly, but it, it's it's substantial. The pers personal property tax is not as substantial as as the property taxes, but it's a it's a steep increase to what we're used to in Hardwick, as well as water rates. So it's a. But but the the population of Montpelier, the access to population, you know, proximity to I eighty nine. Um, and just an incredible, vibrant community here in Montpelier. You know, we, it, it was a tough decision, but as, as we weighed those things, we said, you know, and I think we can do a lot of retail business right at the distillery, which means we're interacting with our customers, and that's going to offset some of the um, some of the expenses of the decision. Does being a capital city help? I think so. Um, Montpelier is the capital of Vermont, and Vermont is the state that has more breweries and distilleries per capita than any other state in the nation. Yeah. But there's no brewery or distillery in the capital, so we we saw that as a real opportunity. You know, it's, it seems like how Montpelier has gone all these years without a brewery or distillery. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, of course, it's got Three Penny Tap Room, which is like one of the greatest places to drink a beer in the entire nation. So maybe that checked the box for the the the, the beer thirst. But there's no distillery here, and um, we think there should be. Well, I, I, I see the article in the in the either the Times Argus or the Free Press. Uh, your business is, uh, is one of the largest, that, well, very significant that they, you moved here and, and uh, the fact that it will be significant to the people of the city of Montpelier. I hope so. Uh, you know, we, have, we employ about 40 people right now. Wow. Um, so that's 40 jobs that'll be, some of those folks are on the road and, and you know, working, you know, in, in other markets, but um, we still, we bring those people, you know, right now we bring them to Hardwick. Um, 
but most of our jobs are, are you know right here in Vermont wherever we choose to locate so um, and we're growing r steadily you know I think we've yeah. hired three or four people per year every year that we've been here so we're actually hiring three positions right now well so, um, before asking Sophia to ask a question I'll just go is that say anything else about the decision to move to Montpelier uh, Montpelier has just been great. You know, we, uh, we, we, as we started out in that search in Hardwick, we quickly found there wasn't a space in Hardwick for us. And uh, so we extended the search, and the search extended all the way to, you know, Lindenville, to Waterbury, to Morrisville. Um, and Montpelier just happened to fall in that radius. And actually, this was the time when uh, Jesse Baker was the assistant town manager. And I met Jesse through one of our employees, who's a, a, an old friend of Jesse's, and Hallie Picard. And Hallie said, you and Jesse should just meet. So we did meet, and, we, and the three of us went for a walk down Berry Street. And I totally fell in love with Berry Street, and, and, and with particularly when we got to the end, and I said, you know, look at all this space. Of course, I didn't, I didn't want to put anything on Saban's Pasture for a variety of reasons. Um, but on the other side of Saban's Pasture, that undeveloped 4.3 acres of land, it just seemed like a really wonderful place. You know, it's got this sort of um, industrial, but we bring this kind of farm to bottle sort of feel with our brand that it, it just seemed like the, the natural space for a distillery. And then positioned right over, you know, looking over the riverfront, that means our people are coming to work and in that really beautiful setting with the Winooski River flowing, you know, right in front of their, their desk. And um, it just seemed like a, a great opportunity. Can I say a little bit about your past? Yeah, so I actually, I got started, um, my path to becoming a distiller, um, I started as a home brewer, and um, I was making beer at home. Um, eventually, I opened up a small uh, retail store selling homebrew supplies, and then um, that progressed into the, the desire to get into a commercial brewing space, and on the path to commercial brewing, I met a guy named Todd Hardy. Um, Todd is the founder of Caledonia Spirits, and um, he's a beekeeper, and he's a particularly interesting entrepreneur. And I had very little understanding of distillation, but I'd, I'd read quite a few books about it. And it's not, distilling is not legal at home, whereas home brewing is. So you can make beer at home, and that's perfectly fine. You can practice that. Um, distilling, you cannot do that at home. So until you're in that commercial setting, you really aren't legally allowed to really know what you're doing. So. Um, and that sounded fun. Yeah, that, that sounded like a real opportunity to learn. Um, so when I met Todd and, and um, got a sense of his uh, commitment to agriculture and sort of his, his beekeeping background and how he wanted to bring that into distillation, I, I think I just realized that I, I like making beer, but I, I wanted to learn something new. And um, distillation was really captivating. Um, so I jumped, jumped on board with Todd, and um, we brought some products to market, and the market really liked what we were making. So we just continue to make more and reinvest in quality control of making those products and educating ourselves and building a team. And um, now today we distribute the same products to 33 states. Um, we also export to uh, Montreal, Denmark, Hong Kong, Japan, um, and we're, we're dabbling with Ontario right now. In total dollars, what are we talking about? Uh, we, well, we sell about, I mean, dollars swing all over the place because whether, if we sell at a retail level, we sell our, our, our bottle for $35.99. Um, that's about the price point that you'll find our bottle throughout the nation. But, you know, transport to California and things like that, it, it, it moves. But, um, but we now sell about 40,000 cases. Uh, that's that's 4.5 liter cases, so about 40,000 cases uh, globally. That, that's our entire company. Before asking Sophie to ask some questions, say something about yourself, Sophie. Well, I have, a, it's a kind of an odd correlation, but I've been thinking, I had the opportunity to read The Education of Little Tree a few years ago. Did you ever read that book? No. I no. assumed you boys would have. So it's about Add an it to my list. old Indian who's a distiller hmm. in the... Uh, what do we think? It was maybe 1915 in Colorado. And he sort of, you know, it's a, it, like you say, it's um, highly dangerous. You're not supposed to know anything about it. <laughs> and you have to do it in secret. And it's kind of um, a heritage. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if your family had interest in brewing or if there was like some heritage that you found as a young man that, you know, 
sort of was the cement behind this? Uh, not for me personally. Todd's family is, is in the distilling heritage. Um, ah. So Todd, Todd's family is actually the, the founding family of J.W. Hardy uh, Scotch in oh, Scotland. Okay. Um, Does he live here? Yes, yeah, Todd, Todd lives in Greensboro, Vermont. Okay. And um, so Todd, and, and, and that's, dis distillation can often be kind of a skill set that's handed down. Todd, exactly. wa Todd wasn't actually distilling, but that's I think that I planted think. the seed of interest of distilling. Um, and Todd is really, Todd, Todd's a farmer, you know, and he, mm. he's, he's truly a farmer. He actually, he comes, I met him as a beekeeper, but now You're he's an organic saying. grain farmer. So oh. Todd's actually now growing more grain than he is raising bees for, uh, for honey production. But we're buying barley and rye from Todd's farm in Greensboro oh, to make our, so our whiskey. Great. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's often forgotten that, that um, particularly with distillation, but also with beer brewing and winemaking, I mean, these are agricultural practices. You know, this, like the idea of, of distillation, we don't distill to get drunk. We <laughs> distill to preserve ag agriculture. Right. You know, if you say you're an apple farmer and you, you know, have a, have a bumper crop of apples, you can either lower your price to sell all those apples or you can make them into brandy and sell them next year. Or apple champagne, right. or, yeah, charge or twice. You, <laughs> you can ferment it or, you, you know, right. if you ferment right. it, you've got a, a shelf life of, say, three to five years. If you distill it, you've got a shelf life that'll outlive all of us. Right. Right. So, and it actually gains value over time. So it's, it's kind of like the original farmer investment, right? It's a long-term mm. investment for a farmer. Um, but I think people often look at spirits and they go, oh, this is a, a, a vehicle for intoxication. Or get rich and quick scheme or something. Yeah, but you know, it, it really is a vehicle for preservation of food, yeah. and um, and it, it, you know that's why farmers and distillers get along so well. well agriculture in Vermont is a great tradition, and fellow, you're in, li in line with it. A great tradition. Absolutely. I mean, we're we're you know our, our distillery in Hardwick, we're buying bags of grain ground up from Todd, but in Montpelier, we're going to have silos filled with grain. You know, so this is really. We're investing in the ability to do a lot more with farmers, which, you know, the farming industry is really tough right now. You know, between dairy or, or um, kind of conventional corn farming, you know, there, there's commodity pricing that drive that market up or down, and you're sort of at the mercy of it. But if you're growing, you know, organic grain for whiskey production, you know, there's not so much of a rigid market that you have to comply with. You know, it's really more about working with a distiller to make sure that your bottle hits the market for the shelf price that the... Um, that the market will bear, right? Which I think brings a lot of um, a lot of excitement to agriculture. Selfie. So, well, I'm just saying. I mean, you've got a nice lead in here to uh, the experiments that maybe you guys have yeah. created to provide such a wonderful product. Sure. And I'm wondering what those look like. So, you know, Caledonia Spirits got started um, on a, a vision of bringing um, the agriculture of beekeeping into distilling. Uh -huh. And we've nurtured relationships with beekeepers. And, um, you know, we used to buy 650 pounds at a time. And now... 650 pounds of what? Of honey. Honey. Of honey. Mm -hmm. and, and now we're buying, <laughs> you know, now we're negotiating for 90,000 pounds of honey, you know, oh, per purchase. Which, my God. which is great because it's coming from the same farmers. And we're, we're basically paying them the same price per pound, you know. So they're, they're se instead of selling us 1% of their crop, they're selling us 90% of their crop. So that's taking the beekeepers out of sales and marketing and putting them, you know, at the apiary with the bees, making sure that the bees are, are doing happy. well. Because quite honestly, the bees need the beekeeper Attention, right now. The sure. beekeeper can't be on the road selling honey. The beekeeper needs to be making sure that the bees they are doing food. well. What's the cost of a pound of honey? We pay um, between three and four dollars a pound usually, um, but a pound of raw honey at the market, you know, but that's when you're buying 90,000 pounds at a time. Right. A pound of raw honey at the market is, you know, 10 to 12 dollars, you know, for one, one pound. Um, but anyway, on, on the experimental side, we see that as a really successful relationship with a farmer. Yeah. And we want to do it again, mm -hmm. you know, so that's kind of our mission. So we have this experimental brand. It's called Experiments in Agricultural Rectification. It's a, it's a mouthful, I realize. But it's, it's, it's intended to kind of rectify agriculture. We see agriculture as a fairly broken process right now. Yeah. And we think distilling is, is a good way to fix that. And... Um, so our first product, we worked with um, the Farnham's maple operation out of Plainfield. They actually happened to tap, they tapped several trees in Plainfield, including some trees on my own property. Um, and we made maple vodka from maple syrup that they, you know, that they harvested, partially from my land, which made it really exciting. Um, but we, 
We made about 150 cases of vodka. Um, we took that vodka to market. We actually held an event at their sugar house during uh, sugar house open weekend. We only brought 60 bottles because we thought that was way more than we could ever sell on a weekend and it sold out in three hours. <gasps> so we probably should have brought three times as much. But that, oh but that was so opportunity. Hilarious. But that was on the dirt roads in Plainfield. You know, that was such a successful <laughs> um, collaboration because we brought a lot of people that were there for spirits to see their maple operation. And, and we found a lot of people there to see their maple operation and said, I didn't know you could do this with maple syrup. So there was right. a really wonderful um, kind of cross-pollination there. And um, education. I mean, that absolutely. seems like... A another really fun project, just one, one more. That this is very experimental. Nothing's gone to market yet, but I, I, I really like this product. Um, we've been working with uh, Richard Wiswall from the Cape mm. Farm. Yeah, Do yeah. you guys know Richard Wiswall? Yeah. Um, well, Richard is a burdock farmer. Mm. So he, he grows he grows burdock, you know, the pest Bur that uh, sticks to your shoelaces and your clothes. Really? And yeah, he grows burdock and he, he sends it, I, I believe his market is in Japan. He's sending burdock root. You don't harvest the, the flower, you harvest the root and it's loaded with sugar. So Richard called us and said, could you make any spirits out of this? Well, as it turns out, you can. And we made some really interesting spirits. It almost tastes like, like tequila or mezcal. It's really interesting, it's really earthy. We're, we're totally in love with it. Um, but the idea of, of building a, a spirit brand out of what we all think is Ooh. kind of an invasive pest. <laughs> yeah. it, it seems like a, a very uh, very Vermonty thing to do. What right. if you bring it right in here? So th this is our core product. This is called Bar Hill Gin. Um, this is, it's a, it's a gin, it's a, it's a um, grain neutral spirit distillate through juniper. Juniper is what makes gin into gin. You have to have juniper. And then we sweeten it with a little bit of raw honey. Um, but this particular bottle is actually the bottle that we brought to our groundbreaking event last week, where, where the governor, Phil, actually opened this bottle as, as sort of the, uh, the celebration. So, so I've been carrying this bottle everywhere I go. Ah. It's a pretty special <laughs> bottle to me. Yeah. Well, OK, so the, the beeswax that you seal it with comes from Vermont. Comes from our, our beekeepers that we're working with are actually in New York. Oh, it's an okay. old it's an old uh, farming relationship of Todd, our founders. Um, they're they're on the other side, which a lot of people want us to be buying from Vermont beekeepers. Yeah, I want to know and what we the are. ratio we're, is. We're buying currently. We're buying um, some honey from uh, Singing Cedar apiaries in Rutland. Okay. Um, but to be honest, we buy so much honey that most Vermont beekeepers don't have that much, up. and they would be better off to sell it for 10 or $12 a pound. Mm. If you're harvesting 30 pounds, you should go get 10 or $12 at the market. But if you're harvesting 90,000 pounds, you need to find a buyer that's gonna pay you fair market price. Be able to handle um, it. So we haven't found many beekeepers in Vermont on that scale. Yeah. Um, but when we find them, we love to buy honey from them. But our, our core uh, beekeepers are in New York. So the juniper, where is that coming from? The juniper is, is shipped in from an, from an herbs company on, okay. the, on the West Coast. And what other components so get to make the The, the Vermont grown stuff would be, uh, we buy barley from Todd. Oh, right, okay. Um, well, we buy rye from Todd. That's, that's the largest volume that we buy from Todd. Um, but the barley we buy from Todd, this all goes into our Thornhill whiskey. So okay. it's 84% rye, 16% barley. The barley, Todd then takes, this is quite a, quite a story, Todd takes the barley, he harvests the story, he brings it to uh, Peterson Quality Malts in Moncton, Vermont. He malts the barley, then it goes back to Todd's farm. Todd, Todd smokes it with a smoker that he's built with um, cherry and apple wood from the farm. Mm. And then we're bringing it right now, we're bringing it to uh, Elmore Mountain uh, Bread. They have a great oh. stone mill, and we're milling it there, and then we bring it into the distillery and, and make the whiskey out of it. It's wow. quite a few steps in the process. So how long does that process take? It sounds like it's like six months. Well, Todd, well, if you include the growing season, you know, there's, there's, yeah. there's quite, a, quite a cycle there. Todd, it's harvest season right now. Actually, my, my next stop today is to go up to Todd's farm and help him, you know, work on harvesting the rye. And right. so that's really the case then. It is just an annual crop as well. It's a seasonal crop, yeah. Can I Jane? talk about new product? Wow. Who knew? <laughs> I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so new products, we're really focused on whiskey. We really would like to be in the whiskey market. We've been making whiskey for five years now. What's the definition of whiskey? Great question. Um, there, whiskey is a category of spirits. So bourbon is a whiskey, scotch is a whiskey, rye is a whiskey, corn whiskey is a whiskey. 
Uh, we've made some bourbon, but we're mostly focused on rye whiskey, particularly because that's what Todd wants to grow. You know, so that, that rye just seems to be, you know, what, what is best suited for the Greensboro um, Well, northern you know, climates as well, right? Yeah, I mean, rye is incredible. I, I actually love to listen to Todd talk about the rye because you plant the rye in the fall and then the snow falls on it and then you harvest it the next season. So Todd likes to say that any, any rye that, that lives through a winter, just like any Vermonter, <laughs> gains a lot of character in the process. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think he's onto something there. I think I, yeah. that, that's not just good marketing. I think there's some truth to it. Well, what you're doing is a great uh, plus for agriculture in Vermont. Yeah. We hope so. It seems wonderful. I mean, are you actively seeking to make your resources from Vermont, or is it just yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, to be honest, there's not a lot of people growing grain. Todd's growing grain because oh. nobody was growing grain. You know, Todd, Todd's a farmer at heart. He's an entrepreneur. Um, and he really, you know, bees don't do terribly well in Greensboro. It's incredibly mm -hmm. cold up there. Yeah. Although, I'll tell you, Todd always has some hives. And um, he planted, well, he planted rye and he planted barley, but he also does clover for cover crop and green right. manure. So he, he lets his land rest, you know, as you should. I mean, you can't just, just constantly it pound on the soil. It's a field system. You have to, exactly. You have to get this rotation going. So he, uh, he plants clover, and his bees have been doing better than ever since he started growing whiskey grains. And that's purely accidental, but because there's so much clover up there, there's so much for these bees to feed on. So well, and the rye, right? And the, and the rye, and the rye and, you know, also everything helps. else that, that's farmed up there, but um, particularly the, the clover. When he started doing mm -hmm. the cover cropping with the with the clover, it, it really made the uh, the bees more productive. So who knows? Maybe Todd's headed down the path um, to get back into the commercial beekeeping again. So if, if a person wants to grow grain, they should grow it more in the southern part of Vermont, southern part of Vermont. Generally, that's what we find. But Todd has been doing really well up in Greensboro, which is you know, Greensboro is the, the part of the state that, I mean, there's probably already snow there. <laughs> <laughs> right? It, it's it, it's it, past the I, I, I've <laughs> left Hardwick gone to Greensboro, and, you know, it's it's 40 degrees and sunny in Hardwick, and Greensboro has six inches of snow. So <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a magical place. Yeah. Well, I, I learned that when I moved to Vermont, uh, the first night at Kimball, my wife put some milk in the refrigerator, and it, and it froze. So I mean, in other words, it's um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. That was Johnson, though, right? That was Johnson, Vermont. Yeah. Johnson State College. Oh wow. <laughs> so, how about your questions? Well, we we were wondering about the um, the development agreement with yes. Montpelier, and maybe that was a question on a lot of sensitive. Yeah, of ground. course. The the um, the city has been really supportive of our project, um, and, and for the most part, it's been all positive from from the community. But there, there's been a few people that say, "Hey, is this a good use of tax dollars to pay a private or to help a private industry business get into town?" Um, but the 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 way that you know the optics of it look sometimes are the city's throwing all this money at a private company. But the reality of how that situation went was. We found this land, we really wanted to buy this land, and the price tag was pretty high on the land, and then we ran into all sorts of issues, you know, environmental issues, yeah, you're right um, on the river. crossing a railroad track, sure. you know, access, infrastructure. It really became just not feasible. You know, we, we just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't buy that land and, and properly deal with the environmental concerns of that land, which we really wanted to do. That was, you know, the How first land is there? there? Uh, 4.3 4 acres. Okay. But the first thing that we did was a phase one and phase two environmental study of that land um, because there's quite a, quite a long history with the granite sheds um, dumping granite debris over there. There's, there's a neighboring property that we were concerned about. Um, so we felt like we did the right thing in doing that research. The research came back that there were some issues to deal with. We started to look at the cost of those issues. And basically it was just, it, it became impossible. And by that time, we'd already been talking with Montpelier, and we had to let them know that we probably weren't going to be able to do this project. And so Montpelier said, well, let's see, you know, where can we collaborate to help? You know, if there's some infrastructure things, maybe there's some budget that we could help. Um, but we need to calculate it on a, you know, so that this brings a return to Montpelier. You know, our property taxes are going to bring that return, um, as well as the personal property tax, as well as we hope, and these aren't even involved in the calculation, driving tourism and jobs and, and all those other wonderful things. 
Um, but the way that it was calculated, I mean, I didn't do the math. I, I, I just you know, understand that, that it needed to be done this way was that um, you know, w I think it's on a 10-year payback. So in the next 10 years, we'll bring more revenue in, significantly more than, than we took out. And to be honest, since we did that math, our project has only gone up in price by quite a lot. And we haven't revisited. Yeah. No, you, know, you got to expect but, but, it to uh, double. Montpelier right? was so supportive. You know, we, we needed power out there. We needed um, access to sewer. Um, we need to get across those railroad tracks, which is a really hard thing to do. The railroad's very protective of who, who they allow to cross the tracks. Um, but then most importantly, we needed to figure out what to do with the soil um, that was contaminated. And, um, and we now found a great solution on all those items. But if not for the support of Montpelier and, and the willingness to really look at this as a, um, you know, as a good logical kind of business decision of does this, town, does this business bring good to the town? And, and you know what are what are the numbers? Are we right side up or upside down on this? Um, and what did you do with this, with this improving the soil? So we found this great solution. Um, the first option was truck it all off site, and I, I I'm an environmentalist. I I don't believe that that makes any sense to take dirt. That's that's it, 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 there's sort of a level of 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 where the components of the soil can be, and we were just on that threshold. I didn't look at this dirt as dangerous soil by any means. Um, so, but because of where it was, and I was told that basically any downtown soil, if you test it, if you do an environmental study of any downtown land, it's, it's above Vermont's it's threshold of, of, yeah, so, so we're all living in a contaminated world, unfortunately. Um, it's not until you go try to build something new that you find out about that, but um, the thought of trucking, it was about $400,000 worth of dirt trucking, just to remove it, just to send dirt to a landfill, which just sounded so counterproductive to me. Um, so our architects came up with this wonderful idea called dynamic compaction and where you bring in this big crane with a very large weight, uh, an eight ton weight, and it just picks up the weight and it drops it over and over and over on this grid formation. And what that does, well that site, the reason why we had the contamination issues were because that, that site was filled with all sorts of granite debris from the neighboring granite sheds. So. In, in some areas, it was as high as, I think, nine feet of new soil that had been dumped in the last 30 years. So you can't build on top of that. So the other big cost we faced was we were going to have to um, drill piers of our foundation all the way down to the native soil. So dynamic compaction allowed us to squeeze that soil so that it had the structural integrity of native soil and allowed us to keep that dirt on site. And then we just put two feet of new soil on top of that. Right, so instead of trucking dirt off to truck dirt back in, yeah, we left works. dirt there and trucked dirt on top of that and squeezed it so that it's strong enough to support a building. So, and I'm giving like, it's really the engineers and the architects can, can cool. really educate people better than I can, but that's, that's my understanding well, of it. You have to see the did. complexity of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was quite a process, but it was really fun. You know, to watch a crane, I'm kind of, I kind of like. We know. watched it too. Yeah, it's, it it's, was neat to have that crane down there. It was just it's, so massive. It's like Fred Flintstone technology. You know, right. it's just like the the world's biggest hammer. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say it was an eight ton weight? Eight ton weight. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Whoop pow! And and that weight actually came from it was the drive shaft of a giant navy ship. That's wow. how they make these. They take this big drive shaft and they cut it and they make these weights out of it. Wow. So there's one company on the entire eastern half of the U.S. that does this, and that, that's, uh, that's who we hired. Now, when you guys were doing the, the pounding of this location, did you see any negative outcomes in the river? Like, was, was, were there granite chunks coming out no. into the river? Or? No, it's all pretty stable. It, it didn't really move. We did, at, with one strike, a tree popped up. So oh. there was a tree in, in that soil. So. Uh, which was kind of interesting. I didn't get to see that, but um, I, I don't think it was it was buried very deep. But I think that was basically a surface tree. But no, we didn't see anything. And, and we've been working very closely with Stone Environmental. You know, Stone has been yeah. overseeing the entire project as well as making site visits to you know make sure that you know, make sure we're not you know we're, we're we're very cognizant of the river location and, and right. You know, I see the drain that goes down towards the river now and the yeah, whole and we the have the building. fencing up to to minimize any sort of um, yeah. You know, dust and debris and things like that. It's good you guys are following the rules. It's a pretty um, central location, actually. We, we have realized in the alcohol industry, 
you have to follow the rules. Oh, yeah. you, you, don't, you don't make it very long. <laughs> wow. And so as a new bar facility, do you guys plan to let people experiment and give you suggestions? We want a burdock beer or Always. we want we, 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 we love to interact with our customers. And honestly, that's why we're moving to Montpelier. You know, we have a very small retail space in Hardwick. Uh -huh. And it's really hard to get people to Hardwick. Uh -huh. uh, but being in Montpelier, there's just a you know we saw it with the groundbreaking. You know we had we had 200 RSVPs to the groundbreaking. We oh estimated my. we had 350 people show up, oh. plus press, <laughs> and um, that's a huge group for for our Hardwick yeah. facility. We can't pull oh, yeah. that kind of uh, population, even with a lot more marketing, a lot more advertising of the event. So. We can already see that Montpelier is going to be a great location for us, um, but that gets, you know, we want our distillers to interact with our customers. You know, we want to know what did we do that you like, what do we do that you don't like? You know, how do you take our products and, and make it into a, a cocktail that you like? You know, that's always great feedback. Well, it's and certainly g a great for the city of Montpelier and Washington County, but it, uh, it has a lot to do with the state itself, and the object is to grow our agriculture. Mm, absolutely and our agricultural businesses. I mean, this provides a very nice venue for young entrepreneurs in the business, farming, mm -hmm. agronomy worlds, right? Mm -hmm. And then also for people who want to participate in a sort of scientific career. Yeah. I mean, it's a really nice opportunity. And where'd you go to high school? This is one of Bill's favorite questions. I, I went to high school at Twinfield High School. Oh, and did I, you? I grew up in Plainfield. Oh, yeah. that's so neat. Yeah. So, I mean, have you felt that your education helped you to be able to handle this question in Vermont specifically? I mean, as a I think farm so. community? I or mean, I, I think Twinfield's a really small school and, and Plainfield's a really small community. So I, I think um, probably the most valuable lesson of, of that path was understanding how important community is, but also how important business is in community. My, my folks own the Plainfield Hardware Store. Ah, okay. So I grew up working in a small town hardware store, which yeah. some might argue that gave me some insight to how to build a distillery but and other various things. But, um, but I, I think the, uh, you know, working in that hardware store really, you know, I saw the importance of that little, you know, it's a very small business in a very small town, but um, how the community kind of rallies around a business and how businesses fuel. I mean, I, I often think back to seventh grade, if you didn't have Plainfield hardware, where was everybody going to go? You right. know, we're going to drive to Home Depot when you needed, you know, one bolt to fix uh, the shelf that was falling down. I mean, there, there's, there's, it, it, but now you look at that, that business, you know, that's a, that's a very difficult business and small town hardware stores are going out of business all over the, the state or all over the, the country. I mean, everywhere, you know, the mm, Home Depots right. and sort of these large corporate entities are coming in and squeezing out the mom and pop shops so that we're all forced to drive further and buy things that are really built for sort of, um, you know, disposable one-time use mentality as opposed to fixing what, what broke in, you know. Yeah. So anyway, you know, I, I think that's really um, kind of ingrained in me that, that business is community, community is business, and those two things have to intertwine. Yeah. Which is, you know, we were very vocal about that when we first met with, with Bill and um, John Holler and everybody, Jesse Baker, you know, that we really wanted the bike path to go right by our distillery. We wanted those people to feel invited to our distillery. We wanted townspeople to feel invited to get to the river, you know, by means of, of at our distillery because we want people to feel comfortable in our space. I mean, this yeah. is really a, a community a, business. Right. Business you, for the community. You know, it made, made people feel comfortable, but uh, the economic uh, aspects for the, for the city of Montpelier and for the state of Vermont are enormous. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, th I think this is just the beginning of this distilling industry. I mean, if you look, if you look at craft brewing and craft distilling, I mean, distilling is following a very similar path, and that means that, you know, that this somebody once produced a study that said, um, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but basically. Right now, distilling is at sort of 1997 of where brewing was, right? Mm. So 97 to 2018, beer brewing. brewing went crazy. So if, if that's true, and this is only 1997 of craft distilling, then it's, it's only growth, and it's a lot more jobs, it's a lot more tourism, it's a lot more exciting, yeah. it's a lot more burdock spirit that we <laughs> get to make. <laughs> you have enough land to, if you want to expand? 
I think so. There's not a lot of expansion opportunity in that space, um, but you know, just Barry Street in general, there's there's some older buildings there that I see as maybe potentially we could expand into those spaces. Um, but our facility is really well designed. It's we've maximized that space, but it's really designed to do quite a lot of throughput. So I, I think it'll last us for some time. But that's great. So if any, any questions further? Um, no, but I'd like to say. You know, I'm really glad to see a young entrepreneur making it happen. Thanks. In it, Vermont, it's, it's, it's a exactly team effort for from sure. From Plainfield, Vermont. Yeah, it's a yeah. wonderful thing to see and to actually see, you know, that crane out there making space mm -hmm. useful and making, you know, a space that was just kind of beautiful outlaying of Montpelier that was unusable actually part of the economy and part of you know the asset that Montpelier can offer so I think that's a big deal and it's a real honor to meet you and to have you here with us today is there is there a favorite experiment that you've had with your brewing or with your distilling well m my recent favorite is definitely what we're doing with burdocks I mean you know, when I go home tonight I'll get my mail and I'll probably get a burdock on my sleeve <laughs> and, and it's a total. So if we can make that into a you know a, a bottle of spirit that people can you know <laughs> take home to enjoy their weekend, I think that's a real win. So that that's kind of got my attention. But um, but Bar Hill has been just an incredible product. And, and and first off, I'll just say that this is a gin that everybody must try because mm -hmm. we sell this gin to people that don't like gin. That's that's <laughs> our, our our business model has has evolved. It was not intentional, but we have people come into our tasting room and they say. I don't like gin. What else do you make? And we say, well, try the gin. And they try the gin, and they say, that's, I like that's gin. gin that I like. <laughs> so, and that, that's done very well for us. That's that's we we started this business thinking that we'd be a whiskey that's distillery, so and we still intend to be. But the success of this gin has kept us very focused on on gin production. Gin. Well, your presence is a credit to the state of Vermont, and uh, we're so pleased that you were able to be with us today. Sophie, would you like to say something? I second that motion. Well, thank you guys very much. <laughs> it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good luck. All right. Thanks.